الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله. All praise is due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on the last messenger of Allah. As my brother Muhammad Naik introduced the topic Islam the misunderstood religion. In fact, it was the topic which was the title of a book uh, written by Muhammad Kutub which influenced me to become a Muslim uh, some 20 odd years ago. At that time, the book addressed not necessarily the same topics that I will be addressing, but it served the same purpose in terms of clarification of common misunderstandings with regards to Islam. From mostly a political perspective, because at the time when I accepted Islam, I was a communist after having left Christianity for communism. So it clarified for me from a political perspective uh, why Islam was the most effective system or had with it the best principles for the running of human society and for the protection of the rights of individuals and creatures on the earth. My talk is focused more from a general misunderstanding held around the world with regards to Islam. And that misunderstanding could be traced back to two major sources. If we assume that the world media, for the most part, originates in the West. When we look at the various news reports, it's by AP, Associated Press, Reuters, all these press agencies, the vast majority of them, are Western-based. And as such, they influence the media all over the world today. We have to understand that the misconceptions which are prevalent in the media today are a result of either one or another factors, of two factors. The one or the first would be that of deliberate misinformation. And that is a product of the Crusaders uh, period in which they encountered Muslims, this is where Christianity in Europe encountered Islam uh, under the heading of the Crusades where they sought to liberate, as they saw it, uh, the Holy Land from the Muslim infidels. In order to generate support for this crusade, there were large amounts of false information disseminated about Islam in order to encourage these people to go and fight, give up their lives to occupy this particular land. Of course, historians since then you know, have pointed out that the reasons behind it were to a large degree economic and not religious at all. It had to do with the trade which was coming from the Far East, uh, trade in spices, trade in uh, silk, etc that the Muslims were the middlemen and they wanted to remove the middlemen. But it was given this overtone of religious uh, struggle in order to motivate the masses to support this uh, crusade. And we could say today's misinformation, deliberate misinformation, is a part of that. It's an extension of it. Or we could say it is a hangover from the period of the Crusaders. Uh, what came out of that period, during the period of uh, colonial expansion over the Muslim world, as well as the rest of the world, is a tradition of study known as Orientalism in the West. Orientalism meaning they specialized in Eastern things, Eastern religions, etc. It included others, but focused to a large degree on Islam because they represented the largest group. And it was missionary based. It was, uh, the, there were systems of study set up in order 
to penetrate the areas under Muslim control, to penetrate these areas psychologically, intellectually. So they made a study of uh, Islamic texts, etc., to try to find opportunities or avenues by which they could confuse the people, create doubts in the peoples about their religion in order to uh, support their own political control over those given areas. As a result, uh, the Orientalist tradition is filled with many lies, things which are outright lies about Islam. Unfortunately, the approach was not one of discussion and debate where you sit down and present what your beliefs are and I will present what my beliefs are, but it was an attack. And as such, unfortunately, that attack was an unscrupulous attack in which they sought to malign Islam in any way, shape, or form possible. So many lies, I mean, many things are attributed to Islam, which even the smallest child, if you ask the child, you know, is this a part of Islam? They will tell you, no, no, it has nothing to do with Islam. Islam doesn't say this. The smallest child can give the correct answer. So we cannot excuse, you know, scholars, PhDs, you know, of Europe, etc., who studied Islamic texts. They learned Arabic to the point where they've understood the Quran, they understood Islamic the text, books of fiqh, etc., that they're going to make fundamental mistakes on certain very basic things which each and every Muslim knows. This represents the deliberate element in misinformation. Now, there is another element of misinformation which I call the inadvertent element. And that is due to misinterpretations where people observe Muslims doing something and then they judge it according to their own uh, cultural or uh, social or religious backgrounds. They interpret it from that point of view. Just as a simple interpretation, for example, uh, if Muslims uh, are seen to bow towards the Kaaba in India, for example, then Hindus who bow to their idols will look at this and try to interpret it in the same light. Well, you know, Muslims are bound to the Kaaba as we bow to our idols, you know. This is not necessarily a thing of worship, but it is a means through which God is worshipped. I mean, this is how it is interpreted. So they interpret it in that light. <laughs> The human heart, greed, exploitation, hatred, all diseases of the heart. For the cure, join Huda TV every Sunday at 20 GMT for Moments for the Heart. Or, for example, uh, Muslims uh, slaughtering of animals. That uh, in Christian tradition, the slaughter was sacrificial for the removal of sin uh, in Christian tradition. So when they look at Muslims slaughtering on Eid al-Adha, they try to interpret it in the same light. Uh, that is one legitimate uh, mis source of misinformation which uh, we cannot blame people for. It is understandable. It's only for us to try as Muslims to clarify to them that it is not as they perceive it. The other source is one of uh, a lack of information where people don't have information about what Muslims are doing and they form interpretations or form uh, ideas about Muslims and their practice based on a lack of information. The other aspect of inadvertent misinformation 
is from the practice of Muslims themselves. Where Muslims, in their own ignorance of Islamic teachings, then involve themselves in practices which are incorrect, which are recognized internationally as being incorrect, and as such, people of other ethnic backgrounds, religious backgrounds, then judge Islam based on the practice of Muslims. Again, this we cannot blame others because it is natural for people to judge a religion based on the practice of the people. You know, if it is common practice amongst these people to do this or to do that, then to say this is from the religion is reasonable and logical, though it may not be the case. So, in this area, I mean, we Muslims ourselves are to blame for this portion of misinformation. And the best that we can do is to clarify for them that Islam is not what Muslims do, but what Muslims are supposed to do. And then we clarify to them what in fact are the actual teachings of Islam. Now, what I intend to do this morning is just to look at some of the major areas of misinformation or misinterpretation, misunderstanding with regards to Islam. And I will divide them into three basic areas. One of beliefs, one of religious practices, and the third of social practices. Now, with regards to religious beliefs, the central pillar of Islamic belief is in one God, Allah. And it has been perceived by others that this God is a personal God of Muslims. As when we read in the scriptures about Jehovah of the Jews, he is the personal God of the Jews. From an Islamic perspective, of course, this is not the case. Allah is the God of creation. He is the creator, sustainer of the whole universe, all that exists. And He is the same God who is found in all religions. However, the view of that one God, because the vast majorities of religions in the world do believe in one God, irrespective of what their followers may practice uh, today. If we search back to the origin of their beliefs, or we sift away the intermediaries, we will find a belief in one God, whether you're in uh, South Africa, whether you're in Korea, whether you're in uh, India here, or any other part of the world, the general belief of all peoples is in one God. The difference from an Islamic perspective, not that that one God is a special God of Muslims, but that that one God is unique. Unique, when we speak of the oneness of God, we don't mean oneness in the sense of he is one, this glass of water is one, because this is one glass of water, but there's another glass of water over there. There's no uniqueness in that oneness. When we speak of Allah, God as being one, we are speaking about a unique oneness, meaning that whatever attributes God has, they are unique to himself that these attributes are not shared by his creation in their completeness, in their perfection. Human beings love, God loves. Human beings see, God sees. But the seeing of human beings is not as God sees. God's seeing is infinite. The past, the present, the future, what is hidden, what is open, whereas human beings are limited to understanding the present. 
with limited information about the past, virtually no information about the future, and what is hidden from them, they cannot perceive. This is human attributes. So from an Islamic perspective, God's attributes are unique. And this is what distinguishes Islam from all of the other religious expressions in the world today. That what is common to all of the other religious expressions is that the attributes of God have been given to his creation in some way, shape, or form. No matter what system you look into, you will find that these attributes have been given either to human beings, where you have God-men or a God-man, or it is to some of the creatures, as may be held in, in a variety of other Religions, historically, we have found people worshipping either animal figures or imaginary animal figures composed of a variety of animals, maybe with a mixture of human beings, etc., etc. But objects of worship, in general, end up being objects from God's creation. What is usually raised as a question in this regard, is one, what then do Muslims visualize? See, since everybody else who's worshipping God visualizes God, they have images, either of human beings, animals, uh, trees, or whatever. They visualize God through these images. What then do Muslims do? And we have to explain to them, to clarify for them, that we do not visualize God because if we strive to visualize God then we have visualized his creation because we can only visualize what we have seen if I tell you about something you have never seen having attributes and qualities you have never perceived in any way shape or form then you cannot visualize it I mean these are among the things of this world if I tell you about a fruit in Sumatra, which you have never tasted, I can only tell you it's like a mango, and it looks like a this, and it feels something like a that. But can you actually really perceive of what this is? No, until you taste it, you cannot. This is the nature of human beings. We cannot see our senses, cannot perceive or understand what we haven't experienced. So, for a human being to try to visualize God, and some people say, okay, well, God's a spirit. Then, when people say God is a spirit, something comes to mind. That spirit is some kind of a smoky, hazy kind of a thing. You know, there are people still are going to try to put something in their mind of what a spirit looks like. So, in Islamic perspective, we don't even say God is a spirit. We don't say this. The spirits are created. The human spirit is created by God. It's not a part of God in human beings, which again, some people, you know, though they say, yes, God is one, unique, and everything else, but there is a piece of God in you and me. You know, that spirit is a part of God. This is a common belief. And of course, once you open that door, so for somebody to say that part of God's spirit is inside you and it's inside me, there only remains for somebody to pop up and say, well, guess what? Yes, it's true. God's spirit, part of it is in you and is in me. But God's spirit is more in me than you. Therefore, you should direct your worship towards me because God's spirit is concentrated in me. You know, you have this kind of philosophies evolving, which encourage people towards the worship of human beings. Whereas, from the Islamic perspective, as I said, you no know, God is unique in the purest sense. He does not have the attributes of human beings. When he is worshipped, he is worshipped by way of his attributes, by our knowledge of his attributes. 
We worship Him knowing that He is the most merciful. We worship Him knowing that He knows whatever we think, whatever we have done. We worship Him knowing that He is forgiving, that He has control over all things. Since everything which takes place in the universe is by His permission, then our worship should be directed to Him. So this is how we worship God without trying to visualize Him in any way, shape or form. So for us, the Kaaba, the direction in which Muslims worship in Mecca, is not an object of worship. The true life of the Muslim starts at death. If you wish to enhance your knowledge of the Islamic perspective on the hereafter, this life doesn't go on forever. But we do so little to prepare for it because most of us don't know what happens after this life ends. If you want to be amongst those who know, then join us every Saturday at 1930 GMT for the inevitable journey. <laughs> direction in which Muslims worship in Mecca is not an object of worship. And it is not an intermediary through which we worship God. Because it is possible to go to Mecca and worship inside of the Kaaba. And nobody who has an idol who he worships to will climb inside of his idol and start worshiping. Because if he does, then he's no longer worshipping his idol, he's somewhere else, he's going outside of the idol. So his worship, those who are involved in worship through idols, they will always have to have that idol visualized in front of them. They work through the idol, either in a picture or in the form of a statue or a human being or whatever. But nobody, it would be considered sacrilegious to go inside of the idol to worship. So from an Islamic perspective, the Kaaba is only a direction of worship. It focuses the direction for the organization of prayer. So pre people and mosques are lined up in that direction all over the world, which would appear if one were to rise above the earth as concentric circles from Mecca over the rest of the earth. So it's only a direction of worship. In fact, the Kaaba was broken down at one point in time. And the Prophet, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, informed us that in the future, it will be broken down again. As one of the signs of the last day, an individual will come, an Ethiopian will come, and he will smash it. It will be broken down. But worship will not cease. Worship will not cease. We do not have to have a picture of the Kaaba to worship. So it is only for the organization of worship and not an object of worship or an intermediary through which we worship. The other point concerning God in Islam, Allah, is that the term Allah, we do not necessarily hold to be the name of God in the sense that all other names are illegitimate. Allah is an Arabic term. So the Semitic languages, the ancient among them, whether it's Aramaic or Syriac or Amharic, etc., these ancient Semitic languages all refer to God as Allah. But if one finds, as I found when I visited Korea some years back, that the name which the Koreans had for God, Hanonim, which was the name they used before Christianity came there, and before even Buddhism arrived there. It referred to God with attributes very similar to the attributes as God is described in Islam. 
then we would have to say that obviously the prophet who would have been sent there because from Islamic beliefs prophets were sent to all nations and tribes that the prophet communicating the teachings of Islam to those people would have communicated it in their own language as Allah said in the Quran that he only sent prophets speaking the language of the people because the duty of the prophet is to convey so that quite conceivably is a legitimate name for God the only thing that we reject is where these names contain other meanings those other meanings we reject but the pure meaning of God being the creator sustainer of the universe who is unique in his attributes this is God Allah in whatever language you express it the other point of misconception and this arises amongst Christians with regards to Muslims because of that historic struggle known as the Crusades is that Muslims reject Jesus and of course when one goes to the Quran the basic scripture of Islam one finds otherwise in fact Jesus' name is mentioned more often in the Quran than Muhammad's may God's peace and blessings be on both of them it's not to say that Jesus is mentioned more times in the Quran than Muhammad may God's peace and blessings be upon them but that by name Jesus is mentioned more often in fact we even have a chapter of the Quran named Maryam Mary the mother of Jesus so it is not true that Muslims reject Jesus but they reject the concept of Jesus being God this is what is rejected the concept of Jesus being God or the Son of God Son of God which in Christian theology in essence means that Jesus was God God became man and dwelt among men this is what is rejected by Muslims but the virgin birth of Jesus which today many uh, Christian theologians amongst the Protestants are rejecting you know you have many today who question and reject even Jesus' virgin birth for Muslims it is a point of belief if a Muslim denies that Jesus was born from a virgin he or she who denies it denies Islam because they're denying the clear text of the Quran so it is a point of faith for Muslims to believe in the virgin birth of Jesus however virgin birth from an Islamic perspective does not elevate Jesus to Godhood does not give him any aspect of divinity because birth is a quality of creation not the Creator as once you're talking about birth whether it's virgin or otherwise you're talking about creation you're no longer talking about God so virgin birth does not indicate divinity it's not evidence for divinity as the law in the Quran himself states that the example of Jesus is that of Adam Jesus is like Adam Allah created them by the command be and they were that is the bottom line and we look at Jesus's creation by the Virgin Mary as being a completion of the modes by which human beings were created there are four basic modes until the birth of Jesus three existed 
human beings created without fathers or mothers. That was Adam. A human being created without a mother. That was Eve. Human beings created with fathers and mothers. That's humankind. And Jesus, a human being created without a father. This is only a completion of the modes of creation. Allah can create us as He wishes. <laughs> According to the Qur'an, we live in a universe that worships Allah. It is not just human beings who celebrate His praises, but animals as well. Join us every Wednesday at 20 GMT for your show, Even Animals Glorify. The other misconception concerning Islam in terms of its beliefs is that Muslims are Arabs. Of course, in India, this is not so much of a misconception because Muslims are living right next to the rest of the population and they realize that these people converted but for much of the world Muslims were referred to as Turks at one point in time and in general today as a result of media uh, propaganda Muslims are looked at as Arabs so many Westerners think that Islam is concentrated in the Arab countries However, we know that the largest Muslim country today is that of Indonesia, over 200 million Muslims, and they are not Arabs. So, in fact, when you add up the Arabs with regards to the rest of the Muslims, they are only some 20-25% of the totality of Muslims. So, Arab and Islam are not synonymous. And this is something which came also out of the era of the PLO uh, activities where terrorism was being attributed to Muslims, uh, Arab names were used, Arabs, Islam, it became confused and deliberately confused in many cases and this impression was given. So when people want to make cartoons, for example, about Muslims, they will use an Arab representative, you know, having a big hooked nose and, a, you know, gutra as the Saudis wear. Usually this is how they want, they want to depict Muslims, that's the general image that they will depict, a typical Arab from Arabia. With regards to practices, religious practices, one of the common expressions about Islam is that it was spread by the sword. And I know this idea is revived in India to a certain degree by certain elements. To give the impression that people became Muslims by force. However, the realities of India belie that. Muslims ruled India for how many hundreds of years and the vast majority of Indians are not Muslims. If they were putting people to the sword, unless if they did not accept Islam, then you would not have found a non-Muslim in India. But this was not the case. Muslims ruled Spain for some 700 years also. And the vast majority of Spaniards did not become Muslims. Many did. But the vast majority did not. Where populations became Muslims en masse, this was by the choice of the people. Their lands were administrated by Muslims. In the expansion of Islam from Arabia, but 
people accepted Islam by choice in the vast majority of cases. I'm not saying that we may not find somewhere, somehow, sometime, an instance in history where somebody forced somebody. But as a teaching of Islam, it is rejected. Allah states very clearly in the second chapter of the Quran, La ikraha fi deen, that there is no compulsion in religion. One cannot force anyone. So it is against the fundamental teachings. If somebody did it, they did it in error. The next most common misconception is that Muslims have four wives. Polygamy. You know, especially for myself in the West, uh, in the West, whenever people find out you're a Muslim, the first thing they ask you about is this four wives, you know. Why four wives? You know, this is the biggest issue. First and foremost, we have to clarify for those who have this idea, that this is not something which Islam prescribes, meaning that every Muslim must have four wives. And actually, you might think, oh, nobody would think that. Yes, when I was in England about six months ago, I met one English brother who accepted Islam, you know, and he had told me that he had wanted to accept Islam sometime before. But he loved his wife. You see, as he said, you know, he said, I really love my wife and I didn't want to marry anybody else. So he held back from accepting Islam, thinking that once he became a Muslim, he had to have four wives. <laughs> right? So again, I mean, though it might seem quite funny to us, people have this misconception because Muslims are presented as having four wives. Now, what we have to point out for people is that having more than one wife, is something which Islam did not invent. Islam did not bring polygamy onto the world scene when it did not exist before. Polygamy is a part of the history of mankind. You cannot find a corner of the earth in which the people have not practiced polygamy. And when I say polygamy, actually, the correct term is really polygyny. Because polygamy means having one wife, more than one wife, or more than one husband, right? And really, from an Islamic perspective, it's only having more than one wife. Having more than one husband is called polyandry. And this is something which rarely happened in the history of human beings. The vast majority of cases, 99.99%, wherever you go on the face of the earth, people have been practicing polygamy. Even in the societies, I mean, the basis of Western civilization is Greece and Rome, Greco-Roman culture. And in Greece and Rome, the law was monogamy. It's true, that was the law. But in Greece and Rome, the majority of the population were slaves. The majority of the population were slaves. And the slave master had free access to any of the slave women he wanted. So though he was officially married to one, he was practicing polygamy. So even the so-called monogamy in the so-called monogamous societies, it didn't exist in the past. And it doesn't exist today in the present. In the West, which promotes itself as the upholders of monogamy, what we find in surveys taken in America is that well over 65% of American males have had sexual relations outside of marriage. Married people we're talking about. So what we find is that the majority are practicing polygamy. But it's called extramarital relations. They have another name for it, right? And by calling it extramarital relations, then one is not held responsible. You see, uh, what happens is that women, especially the feminists, the feminist element, they look at polygamy as being the worst thing that could ever happen to women. And so they lead the frontal attack on Islam with this issue of polygamy. Polygamy is the oppression of women. But really, it is monogamy that is the oppression of women. Because monogamy is not in force anywhere. 
and men make the laws. This is reality. Human society, men have made the laws. We have had a few women pop up here and there. Cleopatra, you know, uh, Indira Gandhi, you know, others around the world popping up for minutes. But who really ran the show? The men behind them. And men have made the laws. So this monogamy, which is instituted legally by males, is not to the advantage of females. Females think it is, but in fact it is not. Because what it does is it legitimizes polygamy unrestricted and without responsibility. Because a man, in the West for example, in America or in England, a man may have one wife and ten mistresses. This is legal. It's not a crime. A wife and ten mistresses. He has no responsibility to these mistresses. To look after them, to maintain them, all these other things. He doesn't. So he's free to have them at his leisure. It is only pleasure. There's no responsibility involved. So it is in his favor that he is not allowed to have more than one wife. Because that way the other women cannot demand of him anything. Because they're not his wife. Whereas Islam recognizes the nature of human beings. And that is to deal with the way in which Allah has created human society. That human beings, when we look at the populations around the world, women outnumber men with the exception of China and India where unfortunately there has been systematic genocide against females right? whether it is midwives being paid to kill uh, young girls at birth which has been reported in India on a large scale or in China where there people are only allowed to have one child and everybody wants a male the females are aborted or whatever so a change in demographics have taken place over the last decades but all of the countries around the rest of the world there is a surplus of females a surplus of females resulting one from wars from wars Wars which are continually happening, which involve death to males. Violent crimes in society. Mostly it is males killing males. Even statistics in terms of births, the number of children that die in the process of birth and in early stages of life, it is concentrated amongst males. And females live longer than males. If you go around the world and you add up all the people who are in their 90s, you will find that some 75 to 80% of them are females. Females live longer than males. Some people say it's due to stress and other things, but it's biological. Allah has created them that way. So Islam provided a means by which the surplus females in most, the vast majority of society could be reintegrated in the society through legitimate marriage. Because females, as for the most part, have a desire to have relations with males. This is created in them, as it's created in males to have relationships with females. So either they're going to fulfill it legitimately, or it's going to be fulfilled illegitimately. This is why after World War II, when a huge portion of the male population in Germany was destroyed, German parliamentarians debated introducing polygamy. Unfortunately, the church was against it, strongly opposed to it. So it was never instituted. And what is the result? In Germany today, prostitution is legal. It is a legal profession. People are provided with work cards 
and medical benefits, everything. It is considered a profession like any other profession, prostitution. Something which is despised over the majority of the world, looked at as being something evil. But there it has become legal.